What is parent-child? It's a relationship, meaning to know each other. I grew up in a home that was sometimes very loving, but I didn't always feel it. Daniel Mate, award-winning musical theater songwriter. Co-authored the book with his father, Gabor, titled The Myth of Normal. What happens if I sense that you, my mother, or you, my father, can't handle all of me? Well, I'm going to sacrifice my authentic emotion that seems to threaten our relationship rather than hold on to my authenticity and sacrifice the relationship because I need the relationship. I can put this one away into cold storage. So if you want to have a, a relationship with anybody, it's 100-100. But what that really means in practice is it's 100, period. It's not your business what they give you. If they give you 10%, that's their 100% right now. The fact is, here uh -huh. you are sitting here. Why are you doing this podcast? Why do you have this studio? Yeah. Because you're committed to some new possibilities. We can only see historical movements in retrospect. And from what I'm seeing, given that I've just landed like literally yesterday, yesterday right. and I've already done three lengthy podcasts with people who are hungry and clearly have an audience who's hungry to hear about healing, and then I'd, I'd say to you, you are doing it, you just haven't seen the results yet. And wow. that's what faith is and commitment is, is keep going mm. in alignment with something for which there's no guarantee of results, but with trust that that's what makes life worth living. Do you think about uh, having your own children? <laughs> yes. For a long time, my biggest reason for wanting to have kids that I could actually locate was Ćao svima, dobrodošli u još jednu zdravu priču. Moje ime je Dolores i ovo će biti prva zdrava priča na engleskom jeziku. Ja se unapred izvinjavam što moj engleski nije perfektan. Dala sam sve od sebe, išla sam i na časove, jer mi je ovaj gost koji je danas sa nama, kao što ste videli i u opisu ovog videa, u pitanju je Daniel Mate. Toliko mi je bio dragocen, toliko sam nekako jedva čekala sa njim da razgovaram. On je inače dramaturg, tekstopisac i edukator. Dobitnik je nagrade Edward Kliban za najperspektivnijeg tekstopisca u američkom muzičkom teatru, ali pored toga on je sin od višestukro nagrađivanog Gabora Mateja koji nam je svima poznat kao psiholog koji priča o traumi. Zajedno sa njim je napisao je knjigu The Myth of Normal zbog koje je inicijalno i došao u Srbiju na događaj Tesla's Planet koje se nadam da će biti događaj koji će se redovno održavati da je ovo tek prva godina. Ali evo, već svetska imena su došla i među njima je i Daniel. Inače je autor programa Take a Walk with Daniel. Zapravo je to mentalna kiropraktika, više o tome možete vidjeti i na sajtu takeawalkwithdaniel.com gde možete da zakažete bukvalno sesiju sa njim. On je i sin čuvane od Gabora Matea koji će također doći u Srbiju i koji sam, verujem da vam je svima poznatiji kao autor knjige Kada telo kaže ne, rasuti umovi i razne druge. Kod nas tri zapravo su tek prevedene, ali stiže još. Najviše smo razgovarali govarali o tome šta je transgeneracijska trauma, šta je zapravo potrebno da budemo bolje i njegov program Take a Walk with Daniel zapravo govori o jasnoći misli koje upravljaju našim stanjem i svim onim što zapravo mi danas jesmo. Njegov otac je zapravo rođen u jednoj velikoj traumi iz koje sada liči ceo svet, a on će nam reći i kako izgleda biti Daniel Mate i kako se transformiše taj odnos deteta kada dete poraste i kada mu je potrebno prosto nešto drugačije nego što je potrebno kada smo mali i kada ništa ne možemo sami, kako izgleda kada te tata zapravo prihvati da si sada jednak, što bi oni rekli, equal. Uživajte u razgovoru i ostavite nam vaše komentare ako je moguće što manje o mom engleskom. Hello, Daniel. 
Hello, Dolores. And thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. I have to say, this is your uh, third or fourth podcast that third you're doing in Serbia. Third in, podcast uh, in two days. In two days. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that you will relax a bit here, at least. It's a very relaxing atmosphere. For for now. And, uh, for now. For now. <laughs> uh, actually, it's relaxing, but I have some... Uh, I'm nervous uh, just because my English is not perfect, mm. so I have to say... So far, I'm getting no indication that'll be oh, necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, the biggest reason why you're in Serbia mm -hmm. is that we are having a big conference um, uh, two days from yes. now. Yes, yes. And uh, the other reason why you're there is the new book, The Myth of Normal. Yeah. And I want to know, um, before we start with the book, uh, how was your childhood? Can you, <laughs> can you a bit, you know, go back and tell us what it was like? And uh, do you have some memories or pictures or smell or, mm. you know, taste of it? Just the... Uh, it's a pretty wide, you know, wide question. Well, it is a wide question, and there's so many different ways to answer it. And mm -hmm. you know, you ask a person about their childhood on one day, and they'll be remembering one kind of thing, and then the next day, I want to give a balanced answer, you know, mm -hmm. because it was a full human experience of welcome to the world. That's what a childhood is, right? Um, I come from a wonderful family. Uh, with, I grew up with a wonderful extended family. All four of my grandparents lived not very far from, like a less than a five-minute drive from wow. us in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a an English grandmother from Manchester and a Canadian grandfather on my mom's side, and then Hungarian grandparents. Or I guess my my grandmother was born in uh, what would what would now be uh, Czech, the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. um, and I had two uncles. And two aunts on both sides wow. and lots of cousins. So big family events. We grew up Jewish, so Passover was a big uh, event and Hanukkah was a big event. Um, a lot of traditions. A lot of traditions. Not We weren't a religious family, but the cultural um, customs that kept us together and kept us creating, sort of a, a, a continuing the family story and creating meaning together were very important to me. And I loved Passover, especially because as a little kid, I loved to talk and I loved to have adults listen to me. And part of the point of the Passover tradition is to pass on the story to the next generation. So in many ways, it's set up to be a conversation between uh, adults and kids. So Storytelling. I, storytelling <laughs> and sharing and thinking about the relevance of the old story to, to the world we're living in now. And of course, my family had its own more recent history of oppression and liberation with the Holocaust not so far, you know, from where we're recording this in Budapest, which is where my father and uncle were born and where they fled from in 56 during the revolution. So, you know, I was very aware of coming from somewhere mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was different than my non-Jewish friends growing up in Western Canada whose families might have been in Canada for several generations or, you know, or who just thought of themselves as... You have roofs. Roots, absolutely. Roots. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes those roots have thorns on them. Mm -hmm. You know, they can be complicated. Exactly. And in the case of being the son of someone who barely survived the Holocaust mm. and whose personality and way in the world bore the scars of that, but also who had a mission in life to help people who needed help uh, and to be there for people's health and uh, to contribute to people no matter where they're from because he saw early in life just how unjust life could be. It was a complicated thing because on the one hand I grew up worshipping my father, especially his public side mm -hmm. I worshipped. I just thought my dad was a very good human mm -hmm. and he is. At home it was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. To me he was a scary figure because he had a lot of anger in him and he's you know he's spoken about this in many interviews so I'm not revealing any this is not like an expose exactly yeah, <laughs> you yeah, yeah. you're yeah there's a time passed and uh, now yeah. we also know that it, it was normal actually well it was it was our normal for sure you know and it was inevitable given, the myth of normal <laughs> well, right <laughs> and, and given where he was coming from or where my mom was coming from who she had her own tribulations growing up so I grew up in a home that was sometimes very loving. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was always very loving in terms of there was love, the feeling of love from them to us, but I didn't always feel it because 
sometimes fear uh, would get in the way. And children can really only feel one thing at once. And it's not so much what the parents believe or feel inside themselves, it's what they're able to communicate to the child. And it was a stressful home. There's no other way of putting it. Um, my dad could fly into a rage at any moment. My mom could get very anxious. The tension between them especially was always never, it was never far away from spilling over so we could be having a very pleasant meal and then, but something in me knew that the next minute the weather could change completely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it wasn't that, peaceful. It wasn't peaceful. It wasn't predictable. It wasn't emotionally secure. It was, it was materially secure. Grew up in relative comfort, especially as my dad became, you know, a busier doctor. You know, I grew up in pretty much an upper middle class environment. But in terms of the emotional climate, there were some things missing. And then there were some things present, like the fear, the anxiety, all that, that were not so uh, digestible for me. And they, they had various kinds of impact on, mm -hmm. on my personality and the way I've moved through the world. And that's part of my journey to sort of solve that mystery and, and un unpack that. And uh, about unpacking and what actually impacts you as a person is the music. And music was part of your childhood. Yes. So how was the music part of your childhood? Because um, I, I will say that in the uh, intro, uh, who are you in your biography? I will uh, shoot that on the end. Yeah. So I love to say that. But um, uh, you're actually coming from Broadway and you're a songwriter and award-winning uh, songwriter. I'm coming from and the neighborhood of Broadway. Neighborhood. I've never okay. been on but Broadway. for us. I know. That's I live in Broadway. New York City. I write musical theater. Most people yeah. think that means Broadway. Broadway actually... <laughs> Technically, in, in addition to being a long street in Manhattan, when we talk about Broadway theaters, it's a certain class of venues that have a certain number of seats. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. so that's, you know, it's a whole, a, a certain group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, when you make it to Broadway, it means you play, your show plays one of those theaters. However, I've worked with a lot of Broadway performers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I've worked on Broadway shows, just not my own. I, you know, I've worked as a transcriptionist for various shows. Yeah, but for us, that's Broadway. I got it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I am, I am <laughs> Sorry. in that, I'm in that, that universe, in that Exactly, order, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I write musical theater and uh, I write lyrics, I write music, and sometimes I write the script as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that's the closest to what's really... I don't know if it's the most at the core of me, but it's the thing that makes me the most unique in my family. And so that's always been very important to me, you know, because... Yeah, it seems so authentic, you know. Yeah, well... When you look all of you, you're, it's so... I mean, it's amazing that you're a songwriter. Yeah, I, the thing about art is that it comes from somewhere in us that's heart. You know, we, we don't have words for it. Um, it's deep. And I've always had a very good ear and I've always loved language. So getting to write stories through songs, characters who express themselves and who discover themselves and who change throughout a show uh, through music and lyrics is, um, it's a wonderful thing to be doing with it's part of my time. Also healing somehow. It started in, in your childhood, right? Yeah, but what's interesting is that it's not healing in and of itself necessarily. I've had to heal my relationship with music Okay. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's like anything. Sex can be healing, but people can have very traumatized relationships with their sexuality, depending on their experiences. Um, physical exercise can be very healing, but people can have, and, and, you know, taking care of one's body, but people can have very complicated, fraught relationships with their bodies and, and with their physicality. Same with creativity. Wow. I think that many sensitive, artistic people, because it's one of the most intimate core parts of us, it's one of the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. There's something behind it. There's, there can be something behind it. And when we learn that our talent can be used as a way of gaining the favor of the people whose favor we need, and we, we, we come into the world needing to be unconditionally loved, whether we're talented or not, you know, to be um, accepted and welcomed for who we are, not for what we do. Oh. But so many of us, especially in this world, through no fault of our parents, mm -hmm. get the message that I'm more acceptable when I'm being impressive, when I'm making them laugh or I'm making them cry or I'm playing, I'm impressing them with my piano playing. Mm -hmm. Then forevermore, the art can become tainted with 
I need to do this in order to impress people. Well, that's no longer art for art's sake. That's art for survival's sake. Wow. Yeah. And so I grew into adulthood with a kind of ambivalent relationship towards it. I had to do it. I needed to do it. I had an incredible creative energy. I wrote and recorded and produced my own solo CD of my songs that I was now playing on guitar. And I put in months and months on it. And I got a thousand copies made, maybe 2,000. And most of them sat in boxes in my parents' basement for years afterwards. I didn't do anything with it. Wow. I needed to express myself. But when it came to sharing that with the world, I didn't trust that. World. I didn't trust the world or I didn't trust myself or the art or something. It was when I moved to New York in 2005 to study musical theater that I started to find a way. And maybe it's because musical theater is so collaborative. You really can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. So learning to work with other people, including learning to write with others. So my first musical, I wrote the lyrics and someone else, a very good friend of mine, wrote the music. The music and part. when you do that, mm -hmm. it's, it's a shared voice. And it's you have teamwork. to learn to trust. It's teamwork. You have to learn to trust yourself, trust the other person. So in that respect, it has been healing. Mm -hmm. And then I think if I look at all of my shows, what they all have in common is they're about healing in some way, mm -hmm. in very, very different ways. I have a show that's a loose adaptation of Kafka's Metamorphosis, but we changed the ending. It's not, not nearly as dark. Um, oh, okay. It's called The Trouble with Doug. Uh, it's about a you know, young, happy American guy who turns into a giant talking slug. Uh, and his family has to cope with this, mm -hmm. this crisis. But what, what did we do with it? Well, it turns out that when there's a calamity, there's an opportunity for reconciliation, for waking up, for breakthrough, for insight, even when there's grief and sadness and loss. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so all of my shows, in one way or another, whether they're comedies or they're more serious, mm -hmm. seem to have something to do with often families or communities um, discovering who they really are through crisis. Um, so in that respect, I'm expressing my experience of or my longing for or, uh, you know, my, my passion for, my commitment to uh, healing through my art. Mm -hmm. And in doing the art, I've had to also find out the limits of art, that art, my art can't the art will not save me. And it didn't save Amy Winehouse, and it didn't save Elvis Presley, and it didn't save Vincent van Gogh. You know? And thank God they all did what they did, but at great personal cost to themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather not go out that way. So of course, if yeah. I try to completely immerse myself in the art and think that I'm going to get healed that way, well, it's a short hop from there to like, mm -hmm. you, know, you get famous, and, which hasn't happened yet, but yet. Who knows if it ever will. Uh, you can see already how my mind works. It's like, well, it's got to happen. But, uh, and then now everyone's looking at you and the way the world sees you is in conflict with how you see yourself. And now you don't feel like you own your art anymore. I mean, it's the most classic thing. It's, it, it's a process. It's a process, of finding, it's a process. That, of finding that balance mm -hmm. of where can I be myself, express myself, share myself with others, but hold on to myself at the same time for myself because I can't live out there uh, I can't live in my art. I can't live in my reputation or in my career. I have to live, you know, mm -hmm. with the person that I am. That I am. Because uh, uh, I, I was uh, dancing ballet classes. So while you were talking about this, I was like, I think I was a ballerina. So I was hiding oh, yeah. in front of everyone. How many ballerinas are traumatized? And, and, also, and are traumatized by the ballet? I mean, that, that movie Black yeah, Swan. Yeah, exactly. But, exactly. And, the, and the musical, the chorus line, is all about dancers and what they go through. And not just through the business, but through growing up into it, their parental expectations, body image stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And the mirror as a, you're looking at it every day That's and right. it has to be for perfect. And after that, I uh, go to media. So it's uh, the same, mm. different maybe and uh, different form. But at the end, it was the same. So when I was starting this podcast, it was actually something healing for me, like uh, let's uh, br uh, break those same yeah. things that you've been doing until now. Okay, stay in this. I love this. I love the way we can impact people. Yeah. But also stay uh, true to myself. So Right. So you don't yeah. need to like mm. drop this entirely and go become 
yeah. a bus driver or something. Yeah, just do but something. But find a new way to do it, a yeah, new yeah, context. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And now I want to talk about the book and also the, you name chapters uh, after some songs. You have uh, music uh, yeah, in there are, the Yeah, I guess book. a few of them are named after songs. A few of them, yeah, yeah. So m music is everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And, and it was very important to me to add yeah. musical references to the book, although I guess the chapter called You Rattle My Brain, which comes from that Jerry Lee Lewis song, Great Balls yeah. of Fire, that was my dad's idea. Really? Well, that's from the 1950s, you know, uh -huh, everything uh -huh. more recent than that. The Bruce Springsteen reference, the Lady Gaga reference, the En Vogue reference. Ah, that's the reason. That was what I ah, okay. So, and you talked about a crisis, uh, and we here on Balkan, I think you um, managed to look a little bit about our history. We are very uh, traumatized uh, area. You guys and, have a uh, word. Like, you guys have a word for being split into many different parts, named after you, to be Balkanized. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> you know? we have so much uh, transgenerational trauma. Yeah. We have so much work to do. And I also hear that you have a sort of suck it up attitude. Just, just, just deal with it. Just you noticed? Stop, stop complaining. That's what people tell me. <laughs> and did you notice? Um, I mean, it, it's probably influenced by the fact that I was told in advance, but I can, I can see on people's faces a certain kind of like determination to just mm -hmm. get through things in a sort of cordial. Stay strong. Yeah, Go. strong, you know. The sort of Serbian version yeah. of the British stiff, stiff upper lip. <laughs> okay, so can you please uh, tell us more about the trauma as a word? Because here we usually associate with some dark and terrible things right. and uh, war and uh, accidents and sexual and physical abuse. But uh, <laughs> thanks to the modern psychology, and this is where you come, uh, it's such a more than that. And yeah. um, it has a different. It's meaning. more than that, and, it, and and in some ways, it's less than that, and that it's less. It can be less dramatic than that. Those those events are traumatizing in that they almost invariably or very predictably induce trauma, but they are not the trauma themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, trauma means wound. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean bad event that like causes a scar. like scar, right? Mm -hmm. So, the trauma is not the car accident; it's the concussion. Because the concussion is what lasts. The, the, the car crash is what happens, mm -hmm. right? So did I say the concussion is what lasts? Yeah. Yeah. So the, tr the trauma is what stays with you. Now, if something world-shaking, horrifying, completely disruptive, completely unexplainable happens to you, especially when you're growing older, but really at any age, you see so soldiers, adult soldiers coming back from war completely and when they saw this you know they gave it a name in world war one shell shock right you you saw things that your nervous system that no person should ever have to see that completely disrupted ripped the fabric of your reality mm -hmm. and your nervous system bears the scars of that sometimes for life that is a traumatic event that caused a serious trauma same thing with war genocide natural disaster and certainly abuse of all kinds those are what we'd call capital T traumas. And there are some more um, domestic kinds of capital T traumas, such as a, a rancorous divorce. Can be, it can be a capital T trauma, and mm -hmm. for many children is. It is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, alcoholism in the family, mental illness in the family, um, any kind of addiction. Addiction. These mm -hmm. things are predictably going to have traumatic impacts for understandable reasons. But they in themselves are not the trauma. Trauma is any wound in the mind-body, which really is the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, that lasts over time, that leaves us more constricted on the inside, more limited, mm -hmm. more shut down, less in touch with ourselves, uh, more confused about who we are, really limited in any significant way. So by that definition, you can have traumas, what we'd call the capital T traumas, that come from something terrible happening. But there's another way that a wound can be sustained, which is by something good, in fact, something necessary, not happening. Oh, wow. Now, that's like... less visible, isn't it? Mm -hmm, you can't mm -hmm. see when that's happening because what's happening is what's not happening. So, for instance, all children, human beings, and this is just the way it is, this is the way our evolution has dictated, that we, we need to be fully taken care of and held and accepted and loved and welcomed into the world. Um, and, and to know that we are safe and accepted no matter how we are and who we are until we're old enough to make choices for ourselves. Which is like 
what age? I'm not a developmental psychologist, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. it, it mm -hmm. you know th these yeah, yeah, these yeah. skills but these especially these those stages, early childhood especially in early childhood you know age certainly the first three or four years of life but there's different stages right yeah, 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 and yeah. there's different age appropriate levels of development mm. but so what happens if a child is born into a family where there's a lot of love but the parents are economically stressed or they have a tense relationship or it's a home where emotions there's a discomfort expressing emotions. Well, any number of those scenarios or combinations of them could result in a situation where the child senses rightly that if I show my anger, for instance, mm -hmm. mommy and daddy aren't going to like that and they won't know what to do with it and I might get left alone, I might get sent to my room and then I'll be all alone. Well, as a child, being all alone, cut off from the source of life, really, which at that age is the parents. We are not independent beings at that age. We're the most helpless and dependent mammals, i.e. the most helpless and dependent creatures on planet Earth for the longest period of time. You know, a horse can run on the first day of life, or at least totter yeah. along on four legs. And we, no. It takes us months and months and months. We, all, we might as well still be in the womb, and we would be if human beings didn't have to walk on two legs and so the pelvis is narrow and our heads are so big because we have big forebrains. Exactly. And so, That's you know. we're capable of. Well, exactly. So, uh, you know, out of compassion for women, basically, nature said, okay, nine months, get out, but you have to still keep that safe container to keep developing. Connected. Mm -hmm. And the, the brain keeps developing at the same rate. Trillions of, 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 of neurons firing together and, you know, circuits wiring programming for life at that age. So what that means is... The trauma is something that it's not happening. The trauma, is, the trauma comes from what's not happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what happens if I sense that you, my mother, or you, my father, can't handle all of me? Well, I'm going to probably, you know, 99.999% of the time, I'm going to sacrifice my authentic emotion that, that seems to threaten our relationship rather than hold on to my authenticity and sacrifice the relationship because I need the relationship. I can put this one away into cold storage and maybe come back for it later if I don't forget about it. And most of us forget about it. That's a reliable and way of stuffing it away. Point. So that is the trauma, not the thing that happens, but the long-term consequence, which is to say my separation from myself. And that's where we lose ourselves as young kids, and then we spend the rest of our lives trying to find ourselves in external relationships, work, substances, behaviors, pleasures, things like that. And we come to this point where we live now, so this is a traumatized period of world, right? Oh, absolutely. Where and th that's the book about. Exactly. And if you, just, if you only looked at 20th century global history, you'd be able to see that, of course, there's going to be tons of capital T trauma in the world. Mm -hmm. Genocide, war, starvation everything, right? Mm -hmm. However, what's harder to see, and this is why we call it the myth of normal, is that what's normalized in our society, which means invisible, in the normal course of things, it's assumed to be normal and natural, mm -hmm. is a state where most of us, if not all of us, are carrying some kind of unacknowledged traumas. Mm -hmm. So we're the walking wounded, but we think we're healthy. Yeah, because everybody say, like, uh, there's less war now. Yes. It's a safer place. So... Uh, when you're looking at that, like, we're fine. Uh, everything we is better. And then when you feel that something is not good, you feel that something is wrong with you because so, the world is better and what's wrong with you? What exactly. do you want now? You don't have a war anymore in the Balkans. Right. right? But, well, except you have the memory of war, not just in people's minds, but in their mm -hmm. nervous systems. And children are growing up with parents who either themselves or their parents grew up under times of extreme stress. And in the book, my father tells the story of his infancy. People can go read that themselves. It's not that my grandmother loved him any less than any mother ever has. Quite the contrary. Mm -hmm. But her mind was on her parents who had just been, you know, deported to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Her mind was on her entire extended family. Her mind was on basic survival. Her mind was on a world war that was threatening to exterminate an entire community of people. Mm -hmm. So how can a mother in those conditions give her newborn or year-old baby the full, calm, loving, responsive attention that he needs? She can't. And She's not capable. She's not capable. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in her case, she had to, to save his life, give him to a stranger on the street. 
But a baby's not capable of comprehending those nuances. So what does the baby absorb? I'm all alone in the universe. I'm it's not, dangerous. I'm not lovable. Exactly. Love doesn't last. It's dangerous. I'd better find some way of surviving in this cruel world. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward 30, 35 years later, mm -hmm. and I'm born in the complete and total safety of Western Canada. No wars there. No, no real danger, unless you're an indigenous Canadian, in which, in which case your entire people was you know, either uh, exterminated or displaced or, and had your culture destroyed mm -hmm. by the mainstream, you know, but that's... Different. I, that, but, mm. Right, but that's so normalized that we, until very recently, haven't even seen it, and many people still don't see it. So even in the most comfortable places, there are people who are living traumas that we can't even imagine. But to, to come back to, you know, 30 years after my father's trauma, I'm born, and you'd say, well, there's nothing like that. It wasn't the Budapest ghetto. It's a it was better, a beautiful, leafy street. Better and, time. And yeah, mm -hmm. Vancouver looks like paradise. Mountains, oceans, what's not to love? Well, like I said, I grew up in something of an emotional war zone. And my nervous system, just like his nervous system, doesn't understand anything about Nazis. Emotional war zone, I have to yeah. put it out. Absolutely. It is where we live now. Many people, many people do. And sometimes it's a cold war. And you guys exactly. know something about that over here. Oh. And sometimes it's a hot war. So I did not grow up in a house where bottles were thrown, but there was a lot of yelling. Mm -hmm. Other families grow up where there's not yelling, which is something bad happening, but something good not happening, which is warmth, love, communication, mm -hmm. tenderness, uh, intimacy. We had that, but it was so mixed with rage and fear and anxiety that I didn't learn to trust it. So that's my trauma. Again, not what happened, not the fact that my father hit me across the face once in front of the whole family because I wouldn't sing happy birthday to him, which is a story that he likes to tell on podcasts a lot, so I might as well tell it. Um, I'm smiling because you're above it. <laughs> well, I'm not but, above it, but I'm, I'm, I'm with it. You know? With it's, it, 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 right, it, it, that's it, the word, I, with I, it. The, yeah. you know, it's, it just is, it's just what happened. It doesn't mean anything about him or about me, mm -hmm, but it mm -hmm. certainly affected me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah. you know, th those events are not the trauma. The conclusions I came to, the echoes, the bruises, the shadows of those in my conscious and unconscious, in my personality, all of those are the trauma. And the good news about that definition of trauma is, by definition, you can heal it because you can't change what happened. If trauma was, you know, the, was. the NATO bombing, mm -hmm. well, tough luck, it happened. But if trauma is the wounds and the bruises and the, the psychological, emotional shadows left by it, that is something we can do something about because it's what's happening inside us, not what happened outside mm. of us. Yeah, but we are not doing it on, uh, you know, on the level of general. We are still uh, under stress about it, and it was 20 years ago. Well, 20 yeah. years is not that long in, the, in this sort of thing. And the fact is, here uh -huh. you are sitting here. Why are you doing this podcast? Why do you have this studio? Yeah. Because you're committed to some new possibility. So yeah. you're at, you can't, you know, history, we can only see historical movements in retrospect. And from what I'm seeing, given that I've just landed at Belgrade Airport days ago. yesterday, mm -hmm. like literally yesterday, yesterday right. and I've already done three lengthy podcasts mm -hmm with people who are hungry and clearly have an audience who's hungry to hear about healing, then I'd, I'd say to you, that's not true. You are doing it. You just haven't seen the results yet. And wow. that's what faith is, you know, and commitment is, is, is keep going, keep going mm. in alignment with something for which there's no guarantee of results, but with trust that that's what makes life. Yeah. Worth that's also the, what parenthood is all about. Uh, you have something that is now very little and 30 years later, you, later you will see the results or you won't or you see won't. the results what i'm saying is that you may it may it's hopefully it'll outlive you mm -hmm. as a parent your 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 hope is that there will be consequences beyond what you will live to see wow now that is commitment that is commitment right wow thank you for this yeah it, it, it's uh, very useful and um i want to go back to the book um is it true that you, uh, the myth of normal was in the making uh, for two and a half years? Oh, you far more than that. Before far? I came aboard? Uh, no, no. I mean, the myth of normal, the book, you were writing a book yeah, the, for the two write, and a half years. No, no, no. Look, the writing of it took two and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before that, there was a year and a half of writing the book proposal and preparing to write it once I came aboard. And before that was six years of my dad doing it alone oh my God. and struggling and suffering and then quitting because he was too intimidated by it. Wow. And he had a different title for it, which wasn't as inspiring. 
So all in all, it was a book that took about 11 or 12 years to, to gestate and grow and then be delivered into the world. Wow. And uh, when you delivered, I have a feeling that it wasn't just to make a bestseller and not just to, to put so many good things to the world, but it meant to you as for your relationship with your father, mm. because uh, I watched some of your interviews and it was so nice to see how honest you both are in front of the audience and now very um, open in the book uh, about your personal, um, how they say, uh, traumas and uh, yeah. healings. And uh, I think we need more of that here. Well, I'm glad it's valuable, you know. Exactly. That's what I see. So yeah. what, what was it? You, it? It took you a time to get there. So Well, sure. Look, it, it could only happen after, uh, you know, I started working on the book, I guess, when I was about 41, 42. Mm -hmm. So which means I'd spent over 20 years of my adult life not working with my father and struggling through a lot of anger and rage and even hatred towards my parents and hatred towards myself and depression and anxiety and all the things and, and a, you know, and a marriage and a divorce, all the struggles that a person goes through to learn just how much they need to heal. And um, so it's not like I emerged into adulthood and was like, hey, dad, let's write a book together. You know, if you'd told me in my 20s I was going to write a book with my dad, I would have been very skeptical. Mm -hmm. That would sound very, very sketchy it. to me. I wouldn't believe it. And I'm like, I don't think I want to. Mm -hmm. Also, what would we write a book about? Um, <laughs> What do we have to write together? What do we have to write together about? Exactly. Um, at a certain point, once I had done my own healing on my own, it became possible to work closely with him and get value from that. Earlier, I would have been overwhelmed, but I just wouldn't have been able to be around him in that close contact. And I don't think he would have been able to see me as a full-grown um, man. man, really. And... Mm -hmm. You know, when you get to age 40 and that's not there, it, there's a real ache for that because that's what was supposed to happen all along. That's the destiny that you're moving towards. You know, nature wants us to be independent beings. So, yes, it was healing for us, but I wouldn't say that's why I did it, at least not consciously. consciously I did it because no. it was a great assignment. It was a great exactly. gig. Mm, I mean, but... it, it paid well, number one, and I'm an artist, right? So having a creative project that isn't my main thing, but it's going to help me afford to do my main thing, which makes no money, that's nice. Exactly. You're surprised by the results. Surprised by the, I'm totally surprised that it's a bestseller. I didn't expect that. Uh, maybe I expected it in Canada. Uh, also, it's just an exciting creative project, period. To write a full, I've never written a book before. So for me to be able to like flex my writing muscle and, and do that. And then third, to collaborate with my father, period, even if we're not getting along, I will look back on that. I would have regretted saying no to it. And it just so happened that working on it together also provided a structure inside which we could heal a lot of things very quickly. Why? Because we had to. Because the stakes were high. It wasn't just about us. If it had just been about us, we could have kept bitching at each other with the, you know, the same old dynamics for years. Same old, same old. Same old, same get, old. But something mm -hmm. else became more important because we both felt that this book was important. Mm -hmm. And we both had our own and, and our shared stakes in it, which meant that when stuff came up, we had to think about it in a different way. Like, okay, how do we get through this? What's really we going on? We have to fix it. How am I? And that the biggest thing was each of us learning to be responsible for our own stuff. Rather than trying to fix it between us, I had to look at, okay, what am I carrying? What am I assuming? Where am I making things up? Where am I remembering things that are not happening now, but it seems like it? And my dad needed to do the same thing. And then we would make agreements. Mm -hmm. Just create boundaries that we never knew how to create before. Wow. So that was a big... Uh, I, you know, I call it scaffolding. It was like a, a training wheels for, for growing up. Training wheels for growing up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, now, yeah, and, yeah. The, and then it also happened that around the same time, we started leading a workshop about that topic, the Hello Again workshop. Yeah, I would love to talk for, about it yeah, too. Which will be our next book, which we're yeah, going to start yeah, to yeah. write soon. But you also had some interviews together on the stage mm -hmm. in front of the people 2019. That's that that's, yeah, that's the uh, 2019, 2016. Mm -hmm. That's the Hello Again workshop, which workshop. we're turning into the Hello Again book. We, s we need that workshop here yeah. because now we're starting to talk about early childhood and everything, but relationship between the child that is now adult and with parents, that's so, how do you say, un, uh, un unspoken. We, yeah, unspoken. Well, let me tell you so, something. Mm -hmm. I think that's true everywhere. Like, we may just have stumbled into the largest niche topic exactly. in history. Exactly, yeah, that's the, it's, yeah, because the world no, one another. If you go into any bookstore, I always say this, mm -hmm. 
look at, especially in North America these days, the parenting section. Shelves upon shelves, how to raise the perfect child, how to raise a healthy child. Mm -hmm. Five to, ways to do it. Five, way, five easy steps. Yeah, yeah. Pregnancy guides, nutrition, mm -hmm. parenting techniques, yeah. how to deal with an autistic child, an ADD child, a gifted child, all, everything. From the moment you conceive to the day you drop them off at university. Exactly. Then there are books about how to say goodbye to your aging or dying or dead parents. And there's a gap in between. Exactly. And there's a few books about like when you're an adult, how to stay away from your narcissistic parents who abused you, you know, which yeah. fine. If you need that, fine. But what about just kind of living as adults in this relationship that started so lopsided, so unequal, the most unequal relationship imaginable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so transformal. Like it right. goes from I'm the boss until... Right, You're it goes equal. from I'm the boss and I down here don't even have a name or an idea. I don't know who I am. I'm just this little thing. That you care. That, and I, I'm completely, I'm literally in your hands. Wow. How am I supposed to ever see you, the parent, or how is the parent ever supposed to see me, the adult child, as anything like an equal or a fellow adult human being? Mm. And then, and even if there wasn't trauma in the mix, that would be difficult. But the fact is there is for almost all of us which means that I'm trying to now have an adult relationship with the person who traumatized me. Another level. Another level. In fact, it shouldn't work. It sounds like a really bad idea. But exactly. it turns out, yeah, but it, yeah. and for many people... Have education about it. And many people yeah. decide, you know what, leave well enough alone, leave unwell enough alone. For now, it's better you to go. Yeah, or just, I'll, I'll see you at Christmas. I'll see you at summer holiday. I'll bring the grandkids by. And when the grandkids are there, then you'll be distracted with them and exactly. I can be on my phone. And Take the grandkids. Take the grandkids and we, I will survive mm -hmm. this relationship, you know, and it is what it is and that's fine. Well, okay, you actually don't need each other, so you don't have to work on it. So what we're proposing is what's available if you do? What does it take? What do you have to deal with if you do? But what does it provide? And um, we are not experts on it. Like, I think you can say that my father is an expert on the topics in the myth of normal. You know, like he can speak as an expert, yeah, yeah. as a trauma also expert. But... but when it comes to being a parent of adult children, you're never an expert, I think. And same thing with being an adult child of a parent. So all we've done is we've, got, we've stepped into this territory first mm -hmm. and we're starting to create a bit of a map to share with people. But we're not, if you look at us on stage in our videos, you may see things you admire or want to emulate, but you will not see perfection. That's yeah, but for sure. that's the perfection for me. Great. Yeah, but how? But not that... everybody. If you look at the YouTube comments, some really? people are shocked that Gabor was Says so some... disrespectful to Daniel. I thought Gabor was better than that. Or Daniel is immature and and, yeah, and disrespectful of his father. Of course, they're looking through their own lens. Yeah, of course, and that's the public speaking. So it's uh, acceptable to to think that. But actually, in their homes, the thing is the same. Well, but it is true that we. It is. I have to be careful not to confuse what we do together on stage with the real thing mm -hmm. because that's not our real relationship. That's our relationship while people are watching. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to be useful for others. It has to be useful for others and or sometimes I want to perform like and be like, are you seeing this guy? Like, do you see what I have to deal with? Like, you interrupt me. I you interrupt, that. Right. And we each have our different <laughs> styles and our different vibes and energies with crowds. So that, but that creates part of the, the, the yeah, productive it's friction. It's like a marketing for that uh, topics. Yes, it you is. Know? Yeah, I, and it's, so I, in that, I see it that way. Yeah, in that sense, it's mm. a bit of a... And we need that. It's a bit of a performance. But so, you know, art is an, ex, is an authentic performance of something. It, it's, um, but again, you can't live in it. Yeah, so yeah. We, we do that on stage, and then we have to make sure we tend to the relationship when no one's looking. That's the hard part. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part. Uh, how was the workshop, Hello Again, uh, maybe 2019 or 16? But uh, do you have some feedbacks from the audience? Oh, so how we do it every it? year now. We just did it twice this fall. Really? Yeah, in New York oh. and in Vancouver. Nice. So and how was next it? next year we're hoping to do it maybe in Europe, maybe... Here? Possibly. <laughs> If not here, then in the same time zone. Europe is so small. Come on, you guys can get anywhere very quickly. Uh, that's so nice to hear, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... Because we're so different in that area, but... I know, but It's I mean, easy to get there. I've driven from Vancouver to New York, and that's like driving from Lisbon to Moscow, and that's <laughs> one country, basically, or, exactly. you know, east-west, one country. Yeah. Um, so how was the workshops? Do we it's great. I love mm -hmm. it. Uh, and, I, and, we're, and we're getting better and better at it. Mm -hmm. We call it Hello Again, a fresh start for parents and their adult children. Okay. And as we said to people this year, what we don't call it is a happy ending. 
for parents and their adult children. Oh. Or a perfect future for, you know, no, it's a fresh start. Which hello if you again. Th- hello again. Which if you think about it, that's not small. Like what if you could know that the next time you go see your mom, you're capable of having a fresh conversation with her. And say hello again. And say hello again, like, but hello again to who she is now. Not just a rerun of who she's always been to you. And she not, has a right to grow also. Well, and she has, but you may not have noticed. And exactly. the fact is you don't, team, you don't tend to bring out the best in each other. You tend to bring out the past in each other. So wow. the question is, why is that? So what we're doing is we're lifting up the hood, looking at the mechanics of that and giving people mm-hmm. not, I mean, yes, some tips and techniques. But first, as with all my dad's work, as with the myth of normal, same thing here, awareness comes first before solutions. You can't, just to talk about it. Just to even have a language to speak about it, that's right. Yeah, so and do they come uh, together as father, sons, uh, mother? Many do, mm-hmm. and some don't. Some people okay. come alone either because the parent or child is not available, mm-hmm. or because they're not willing or interested, or because there isn't even a relationship there, and in some cases, one of them is dead. But you still have a relationship to that person. Wow. You have a relationship to your relationship. You have a relationship with your memories of that person, and that's affecting you every day in your life, whether you know it or not. Wow. So whether they come together or alone, and it's obviously a slightly different thing, people come, and the first thing we do is we split them up if they came together. Do not sit with the person really? that you came with. No, for the first day and a half. In uh, fact, in, First until, they sit together, and then you do a small... No, no, no. First day, don't sit together. Don't sit together. Only in the last hour and a half of the workshop do we let them sit together. Before that, nice. they sit with strangers. Wow. Because, Why? That, well, so if I'm an adult child at the workshop, I'm encouraged to sit with a parent who I don't know. Why? Because it's going to allow me to be honest in a non-defended way. I have, if I want to be able to see the dynamics, I have to step outside them for a second. In a meta position. In a meta position, mm. in, an, in, in, an, in an external watchful position, exactly. I need some distance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we tell people, you're not ready to sit together yet. It won't be fresh. Don't do it. And... It, you know, you don't even need to talk on the breaks. Just leave each other alone. Yeah, go in and, different directions. And the other thing that that trains people in is realize, because when we're in these relationships that are so intense, so much of our attention is on the other person and what they're doing and what they're thinking, what they're saying. And pointing analysis, fingers. Pointing the and, finger and, yeah, and like... Tennis match. Yeah. Tennis match and adjusting and strategy, exactly, right? Reacting, just reacting. When you sit apart from each other, Then we can say, okay, look at yourself, because actually 80% of the relationship or about thereabouts is happening inside of you. It's not happening in between the two of you. It's happening inside your relationship with who you think they are and who you think you have to be to deal with who you think they are. The reaction, the reaction is only the consequence of, That's exactly right. of the thought. That's right. And then the thoughts manifest in emotions, in perceptions, And then in actual behavior, which gives you the relationship you have. So if you want to transform the relationship, you need to, you know, we, you know there's a cliche that relationships are 50-50 or they're a two-way street. Is it a cliche? Well, look, yeah, I think it's a cliche because it's like half true, but it's also, if you just, if you stick to that, you're going to have a miserable relationship. Because there's always like, I gave 50%, he didn't. That's exactly right. You always have an excuse and you can't control theirs. So if you want to have a, a relation with anybody, mm-hmm. with the world, with yourself, with your partner, with your kids, it's 100-100. But what that really means in practice is it's 100, period, point final, you know, because... You don't accept... You don't, it's not your business what they give you. If they give you their, if they give you 10%, mm-hmm. that's their 100% right now. What are you going to do with it? That's your 100%, which means you're responsible for your own experience, your own reaction, and your own backlog of memories and stories and narratives and reactions and all of that kind of stuff. So, if you, so that's why we separate them for about a day, day and a half. Nice. To break, so how the, long break the addiction to focusing, fixating on the other. It's, about a, it's either a day and a half or two days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, intensive. Intensive. And people get... People have breakthroughs, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes little breakthroughs, sometimes big breakthroughs. We've seen parents um, reveal to their kids and sometimes in front of the whole room childhood abuse that they'd never told anybody and their kids knew on some level because they could feel it that was there, mm-hmm. but they'd never told them. Can you imagine how meaningful that is for both of them? Mm-hmm. We had a woman in our last retreat in uh, or our last workshop in Vancouver. She came out to her father as a lesbian 
at age 30. They were sitting there together in the, and she'd never told him. And it's not like she was afraid of his disapproval. He wasn't a conservative guy. Mm-hmm. But somehow just revealing something that intimate about herself was just not, just keep a distance. But she revealed it and he was great about it. And that's going to change their future. Well, because you actually, um, you know, you, you make a place for it. Because yeah. we always like, the, the children are the most important thing in our life and everything. But it's a question how much we actually do about it. So those workshops are like making a place for it. Uh, That's right. Sit here and actually do something. Yeah. It's, not it, it's not all, during the Christmas Eve. It's all well and good to talk about your values. But if I want to know your values, I'm going to look at what you value. I'm going to look at what you spend you know, value, currency, you know, energy, resources. I'm going to look at what you spend your time on, your energy on, your mental energy on. And so many of us are not living aligned with our stated values, which creates misalignment. We think that we have those values. We, well, we, we have them on paper only, which means we don't. We, we have exactly, we have something else. And you always, I like to say, you always win the game you're actually playing. You always live out the values you actually have. So if you want to know what your values really are, look at how you live. And don't use that as a way to beat yourself up. They say when you when nobody is watching. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, can you tell me more about the um, your point of uh, view to your father when you or mother also when you say I don't need to learn from you, I need to relate to you. Hmm. Did I say that? Yes. Um, I'm, I must be very smart. Very smart. Like <laughs> it was actually not so long time ago. Yeah. What does it mean? Well, I think that's that, that transformation of relationship. Yes. That moment. Stop well, teaching me. What is parent-child? It's a relationship. Right? It's not a job. It's not meant to be you're the teacher and I'm the student. Mm-hmm. It's a lifelong relationship, meaning to know each other. And the way I want to learn from my parents is to know them as human beings not to hear what they think or believe or what their values are or what spiritual or psychological books they've read, Mm -hmm. including the books of Gabor Mate. I want to know them, right? So I think I grew up in a home with two very smart parents and I was a very smart child and we learned to relate to each other with words. And one of the well-meaning, very well-meaning, but I think it, you know, it's still a well-meaning mistake my parents made, is assuming that because I presented as a smart, precocious, intelligent child, that I was ready at a younger age than I was to hear things that were not meant for me to hear. Mm-hmm. For instance, yeah. hearing about their relationship, they didn't make any effort to hide it, to hide it or to, not even to hide it, but to insulate me from it. Mm-hmm. You know, wow. like there's a way to tell a child, hey, mommy and daddy get angry at each other sometimes. It's hard to be married. We love you very much. We love each other. This is part of it. That's how you tell a child about the fact that you had a fight, not doing it right there at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Or when I'm 10 or 11 years old, explaining to me how you traumatized me. And that's why I'm having trouble with girls. Now that does something to a child. Now it's meant very well, Mm -hmm. but now I have this piece of knowledge about myself, you know, now Oh, that's why I, okay, well, I guess I'll be like that forever. Well, now that's why, and now I'm self-conscious of it. And maybe I'm start to talk about it at school. And of course that goes over really well with my friends. You know, mm-hmm. I don't get to just be a kid. Yeah. So um, that's what I meant, I think, by I don't want to learn from you in terms of your words. I don't want lessons. I don't want lectures. Yeah. I don't want book citations. Mm-hmm. I want to know you, what have you been through? What do you struggle with? Is it okay to struggle? Is it okay to be unconfident? Is it okay to not know yourself sometimes? Mm -hmm. What do you love? What makes you excited? You know, relating only through the mind and the intellect um, is a poor substitute for a heart connection that's really about fully knowing the other. I will learn the most from it, That's not exactly from right. the, the lessons you gave me. Uh, now I want to talk about... Uh, well, see, what I'll learn from the lessons you gave me, if you didn't embody them in the way you behaved, is that I can't trust words. If, 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 you, gi- if you give me one message verbally mm-hmm. and act out another message behaviorally, then I am going to learn something, but it's not what you said. Stephen Sondheim, the great musical theater writer has a song called children will listen and he says careful the things you say children will listen and learn you know children may not obey but children will listen 
Wow. And it, he doesn't just mean they'll literally learn the words you say. They'll learn by the discrepancy between what you say and how you are. And how you are. They'll learn that I have to be on guard. I can't trust you. I can't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. I have to be sneaky, all kinds of stuff. I have to suppress parts of myself, and that is also the trauma. Mm -hmm. Wow. I want to go to your program, uh, Take a Walk with Daniel. Oh, sure, yeah. Because uh, I want to apply for it, and it's such an amazing... Uh, you don't have to apply. You can just book a walk. That, that's what I mean. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, I, 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 you want to sign up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. That, that's the, the English, but now I learned something. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's like a 15 minutes consult with yeah. you. But first of all, tell us, how did you get that idea of doing it? Did you take a walk with somebody? So I did. I took a walk with a friend. Now, I, there's two components to it. It's, it's take a walk with Daniel, a mental chiropractic, chiropractic service, yeah, yeah. which is a big mouthful. And what the heck does any of that mean? Mm -hmm. So I had already thought of myself as a mental chiropractor because somebody, I was working in a therapeutic space, in like a psychedelic therapeutic space in Peru with the woman I was then married to who was an apprentice of my father's in his therapeutic compassionate inquiry method. Mm -hmm. And at the time I had lost some of my identity in the marriage in the psychedelic world. I wasn't as focused on musical theater. I didn't really know who I was at the time. I was going through a period of not well, knowing what not is happening. Knowing, you know, mm -hmm. an, uh, a, a crisis of some kind, I guess a midlife crisis. And so I was working with the woman I was married to in that space. And one of the participants said to me, you know, I was expecting you to be like Gabor Jr. I said, God forbid. He said, you know, you don't work like him. I said, I know, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to. I do my own thing, but what would you call it? He said, you're a mental chiropractor. And I liked that because what it captured is I'm interested in not what your trauma, I assume you're traumatized. I know you're traumatized because I am too. And probably you know it too, so we can refer to it. But I'm not, I don't have the patience mm -hmm. and the deep empathy that my father has. You know, people, when he's around, when he's speaking, they feel seen and heard and understood, sometimes for the first time. You know, and that's his gift. Mm -hmm. My gift is like, okay, got that. Now, what do you want? What's stuck right now? How is that manifesting? Let's, Let's assume that maybe you don't need to spend years and years and years healing before you can have a victory, a breakthrough right now in your actual life that you're living. Wow. Because there is no, there's no you know, heavenly gates of healing waiting for us. Some sweet by and by where everything will be healed. No, we've got to deal with what our lives as they are now. Mm -hmm. And if we know that we're in a healing process, well, that should just encourage us to be kind to ourselves and gentle with ourselves. But just because we're gentle doesn't mean we can't be tough. Tough in the same way that a coach would be tough. And what does a coach do? A coach believes in you more than you believe in yourself. So what I do with people is I say, okay, I don't want to hear about your big capital I issues. Oh, thank you. You have sexual abuse issues? Go see a therapist, a somatic therapist, a talk therapist, whatever. Your sexual abuse traumas are showing up in a particular relationship and you're stuck. You don't quite know what to do with that or how to communicate it or, or what to do about it or what choice to make. That's Let's a, fix the bone. Th exactly, so that the rest of the body can relax, which will help the larger healing process. Mm. And we don't need three years for it. We don't need three years for it. We need an hour and 15 minutes. Wow. Or an hour and 40 minutes, and we need to be walking. That's a longer walk. You need, we need to walk, we, so if yeah. we do it online, we, I have to put the Yeah, Yep, ear? and I do too. And I walk in Brooklyn, New York, and you walk in Novi Sad, or Saudi Arabia, or uh -huh. South Africa, or San Francisco, yeah. wherever so, you happen to be. What, what is it about that walking? Well, so it happened when I was walking with a friend who had requested a mental chiropractic adjustment for something that was driving him crazy. Mm -hmm. And it happened very quickly. And he said, you're really good at walking with people. And I said, you know what? I am because I love walking and I love conversations that happen when we're walking. When I was a kid, you know, I was just verbally incontinent. I couldn't stop myself from talking. I needed to be talking all the time. And my favorite thing was to go for walks with my grandfather. And the way that he would keep me focused on walking would be we would count out loud up to a thousand. That's the only way he would get me to walk with him. So walking and talking was also my way of relating to my favorite people and feeling safe. So when I'm walking for whatever reason, first of all, and you know, somatic psychologists have told me that there's good science behind this. It makes sense. Exactly. I wanted to say it because they, they said that about the children also. If you want to learn something 
uh, if you want to teach them something, then uh, let them walk and see like five red things around them. So they, they think better, the brain is working much yeah. better, and especially those uh, subjects. That's exactly right. Now, given that the purpose of my mental chiropractic service is to shift people's perspective, what better to do something than to do an activity where literally with every step you're shifting your perspective, your point of view is different. And even if you come around to the same place where you started, it'll be a different time of day, the clouds will be different, different surroundings, different people, different cars. So wow. it just seems to work really well. And I want to write a book about it, so I will do some more research into why it works. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it was just a hunch. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, I, I walk when I talk uh, on the phone. Yeah. Sometimes I feel better, and uh, even in the circle, you know, I, around my dining room or something. And yeah, it and works, I would say, something is better than sitting and talking. Yeah. And we're now sitting and talking. Yeah, and I would say that, you <laughs> know, te walk. technology has all kinds of uh, dangers and drawbacks, but I like being able to go for a walk and talk on the phone with someone who's far away. And, and people often say to me, oh, are you coming to, are you, are you coming to Vancouver or, or are you going to be in New York? Because I really, really wanted to walk with you in person. And I can understand that. But what I say to them is, if anything, doing it by phone is better because the purpose is not my company. It's not about me. It's about you being with yourself and I'll be that little voice in your head that's going to say things that you wouldn't normally hear. Here. And then you can hang up and guess what? You'll be with yourself with your new perspective. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow you will keep that thought and exactly. you well, will see what you're going to do with it. And it's it. not going to be like, wow, that Daniel, he's a really great guy, which, you know, he is. He is. But that's not the point. And you will know that. That's exactly right. Because there's an actual chiropractic there. Yeah, and I, I only do it because I love mm -hmm. seeing people get crystal clear about something. I, lo I love seeing something crystallized for people and it's like, oh, of course, great, perfect. I have a choice where I didn't have a choice before. Mm -hmm. I live for that. You, you know, but it's also connected to your childhood. You're, you, you mentioned your grandfather. Yeah. So that, that, that's so... Um, it makes me feel very young, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, oh, I have um, one more question for you, and okay. you don't have to answer. Okay. But do you think about uh, having your own children? <laughs> yes. You I answer do. to me. Thank you. Yeah, no, I do think about it. And um, it's, it's not a simple thing for me. Um, for a long time, I was ambivalent about it. I really wanted it, and I really didn't want it. And when I got married, I thought it was going to happen. And one of the great heartbreaks of my life was that that marriage was not built for that. And of course, it's a great relief that it didn't happen inside of that marriage, because that would have been a recipe for repeating a lot of the things that I don't... I would rather not pass on mm -hmm. the exact same traumas that I... If I'm going to pass on some traumas, let's get some fresh ones, you know? Let's, let's get some newer, better ones. Um, I'm 47. Fortunately, as part of the male half of the species, I'm told that there's a bit of a longer shelf life for my, my fertility. Oh, no. Yeah. I hear like Paul McCartney was having babies into his 70s. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah. look at the George Clooney. Exactly. Now, you know, whether I want to be one of those guys who's, you know, you know dating women that much younger, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I would. Mm -hmm. But one, you know what the, one of the thing is? For a long time, my biggest reason for wanting to have kids that I could actually locate was my parents deserve to be grandparents. My, the Mate line cannot end with me. It's my obligation. If I don't do it, no one, my siblings may not. Now that is a bad reason to have kids in and of itself. You need to find another reason. You need to find another reason that's for me. Mm -hmm. And would it be lovely to see my parents be grandparents? Yes, it would. You know, and it's easy to jump to, uh, you know, because actually I used to literally have this thought, if I don't have kids, then it means Hitler won. Because he killed off the... Ma now, of course, I, no, no, my no, uncles I, have grandkids. Like, there are Mate children coming. Uh, of you know. course, but I know even what you're saying. Like, what a burden for me to carry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, know, you need to you find know. a bigger one. I need to find a bigger, better one, which is to say, what do I have to give? What do, I want to, what do I want to actually give? What do I want to provide 
Wow. Uh, and you know what? It, it may well be that I say, you know, I want to provide something I didn't have. But again, that can't be the reason either, because then I'm going to try and turn them into a, a little version of me, and, a mini uh, me. Yeah, and, and, and it's and, all and about as, you. It's all about me. And then I'm going to not see them as them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see them as an extension of me or a disappointment of that expectation. And guess what? Now I am repeating the trauma that I received because my parents had a hard time seeing me as an individual. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a complicated question, yeah. but, it's, uh, but it's one connected to my heart, and I think the answer is very much yes. If that could happen, it would be, in the truest sense of the word for me, a miracle. And I believe it's possible, but I can't force it to happen. I can just continue to try and create the conditions in which that is a possibility and a good idea. Wow. Thank you so much. My it's been pleasure. wonderful to have you here. And uh, I hope that Novisad will uh, host you well and that you will come again. Thank you so much. Thank I hope you. so too.